very much and I will do the same as before. Can everybody at the back give me a wave if you can hear me just fine? Fantastic, that's what I like to see. Um, so thank you very much for having me along today. Uh, my name is Nicola and I am the curator at the National Mini Museum Scotland, which is based in Lady Victoria Colliery in Newton Grange. So the colliery itself was opened in 1895 and was a Victorian super pit, but it closed in 1981 and shortly afterwards became the museum that it is today. Uh, we are an independent charity and we rely on external funders and our amazing visitors to help us continue our mission to preserve and promote Scotland's mining history and heritage for current and future generations. So for the next 20 minutes or so, I'm going to cover a, a wealth of mining history with a bit of focus on East Lothian and the odd tangent here and there. So coal has had a profound impact both on uh, the people and the landscape of central Scotland. At its peak in the early 20th century, the Scottish coal industry directly employed almost 1, 000, uh, 150,000 people. It had become a massive industry which fuelled a complex economy at the heart of the British Empire and which exported coal throughout the world. The story of mining in the Lothians is dominated by coal, although other minerals like clay, ironstone, lime and sandstone were also worked. One of the most conspicuous reminders of mineral extraction are the vast bings of spent shale that dominate the landscape of West Lothian and what was the southwest corner of Mid Lothian. They testify to the scale of the oil industry that flourished for over 100 years from the 1850s. So coal has been mined in the Lothians for centuries. The Mid Lothian coal field or Esk Basin is essentially like a huge bath. So nine miles long and about four and a half miles wide, it runs roughly southwest to northeast, with Gorebridge and Pennycook at one end and Portobello and Longnedry at the other. The basin, which gets deeper as it heads out into the Firth of Forth, is made up of numerous seams which outcrop around the edge at various places. So with that being said, if the Midlothian coal field is a bit like a bath, the East Lothian field is more like a wash hand basin of about 30 square miles. Neither coal field observes the man-made um, county boundaries, of course, with Carberry and Wallyford pits being operated in the East Lothian field, while Preston Pan pits being worked in Midlothian. The first mention of coal in Scotland is found in a charter granted in 1291 to the Abbot and Convent of Dunfermline, giving them the privilege of digging coal in the lands of Pitt and Creef. But the first workers of the mineral are supposed to have been the monks of New Battle Abbey, which is all of 10 minutes up the road from Lady Victoria Colliery. The monastic communities across the east coast of Scotland did exploit coal, mainly for kilns and for salt panning. However, the general population didn't really use coal, much preferring wood and peat for domestic purposes. And it wasn't until the 17th century onwards that coal really came to the forefront of people's minds for both industry and for domestic use. Therefore, after the Reformation and as we move to the 17th century, the big landowners really took over. They developed coal workings as commercial enterprises. And in the 17th and early 18th centuries, most of Scotland's coal actually came from around the Fife and the Lothian coast. Much of it was exported and the Forth became one of the busiest trading areas in the British Isles and a centre of the salt industry. However, Coal workings and salt pans were dangerous and unpleasant places. And by the early 17th century, it was proving difficult to recruit and retain people to work in them. The Scottish Parliament, anxious to avoid disruption over such important industries, passed a law in 1606 to protect them. Sadly, the act effectively tied colliers and salters to their overlords, much like serfs. 
Men were regarded as part of the mine and they were unable to leave to find work without permission of their overlord. And since that permission was unlikely to be granted, they were effectively stuck. If they left of their own accord, they were deemed to have stolen themselves from their employer. And pictured here is a, a replica surf collar that's currently on display within the museum. This law remained in place until 1799, but the legacy of that lingered long after in the minds of both the landowners and the miners themselves. And as we are in the 1700s, I would be remiss not to mention the wagonway. Um, so Scotland's earliest railway was a, a wooden railed wagonway laid in 1722 to connect the collieries at Trenent to the harbour at Kakenzie. In 1745, Sir John Cope deployed his troops along it in an attempt to stop Bonnie Prince Charlie from marching on England. But at the Battle of Preston Pans, the Jacobites cut them to pieces. The wagonway went back to carrying coal and was fitted with iron rails in 1815. By the 1870s, only the end of the line near Trenent was in use and full gauge track was laid astride the old rails, although it continued to be used until about 1886. Uh, the main Edinburgh to Berwick railway line crossed the old wagonway at Meadow Mill, much later than the period we are discussing at the moment. A washery was also set up there to treat the coal from Bankton Colliery, which was sunk in about 1901 and in association with Preston Links Colliery. So as we move forwards out of the 18th and towards the 19th century, we turn back to the miners themselves. Prior to 1842, we know that men, women and children as young as five years old went down the mines. Sadly, on the 4th of July, 1838, at Husker Pit in Silkston Common near Barnsley, 26 children lost their lives in one tragic accident. Public concern for the welfare of children had already been mounting since the 1833 Factory Act, but this accident made it all the more urgent to take action. In 1840, the Children's Employment Commission was set up and four commissioners were appointed to collect and compile evidence for the commission. Britain was essentially divided into districts and they inspected and interviewed a wide range of people from the coal mine owners and managers to the miners themselves and the youngest children working. Very significantly for the first time, drawings were also included to show exactly what the commissioners saw. And the pictures here are just some of the drawings from the final report. I'd like to read two very short extracts from these interviews uh, from two miners based at Elphinstone Colliery, which was located between Elphinstone and Ormonston. So this was from William Wilson, who was eight years old and a coal putter. Assist Sister Margaret to push the carts on the railroad in the pit. Mother takes us down at six in the morning and we come away with her at night. Gets broth or some such like. Has been obliged to gang when the lamp would no burn and scramble to get up. Like the daylight better than dark. It is off a dark in the pit. Never been to school. A teacher came here last week and father is going to send me. Sister has been one week at school. She likes it fine. We are to wash and change ourselves when we gang to school. And this is from Janet Dawson, who was 17 years old and drew coal. I work 12 hours below ground and I've done so more than six years. The work is very severe. When the cart is on the bray, I'm obliged to get another putter to give me a lift. Often been injured, I'm now laid aside, having lost the tops of my two middle fingers, been idle eight days. I do not know whether work above would suit me, as I've been so long in the pit, never tried other labour. I can read, never was taught writing, can make my own pit clothes, can earn when full employed 14 pence a day. 
So needless to say, the public were shocked when the findings of the commission were published, partly because of the horrible conditions and injuries, but also in part due to men and women working underground in a state of undress and also because of women often wearing trousers underground. In any event, due to the findings of the report, women and children under the age of 10 were banned from working underground. For those boys aged 10 and up, it was many more years before that age was raised and it was still a very hard and dangerous life. Excuse me while I break the various things in front of me. Um, it's worth noting that while most of us would think this is obviously an excellent thing with women and children safer, healthier, receiving an education, it wasn't always seen as a positive thing. Many of these families were reliant on either all or most members of the household bringing in an income. And as a result of this legislation, family income as a whole was greatly reduced. This led to women seeking employment at the surface, such as at the picking tables, which you can see on the screen here, um, or indeed in other industries. And there were reported occasions of women disguising themselves as men to be able to sneak back in underground. On one particular occasion, uh, apparently women from Dryden Colliery were arrested for having attempted this, taken up to the Sheriff Court where they pled womanly insanity and managed to get the charges dropped. Um, so just a very slight tangent here, uh, we're really lucky to have this photograph of the McGuigan family, as on the back of the photograph was recorded a good bit about their own family history. So this photograph was taken around 1900 and shows the family in their Sunday best. They lived in Spital Row, just outside Blantyre. Their father was Irish and moved to Scotland to work in the Scottish pits. And the mother came from a much more prosperous Glasgow family who unfortunately disowned her when she married a minor. However, they had 10 children, eight of whom survived. And because they all worked in the pits, the family enjoyed a tolerable level of security. The smallest boy right at the front of the photograph left the pits due to ill health and became active in the Communist Party. And all the girls in the photograph worked on the picking tables until they were married. The older boys all worked underground, one as a tramp brusher, which was a very dangerous job, which meant he cleared the underground roadways. Another as a fireman, and the eldest brother was a minor, but his career ended only a few years later as he went blind from the Glenny Blink, which was an eye disorder caused by dim light. But overall, they were a very typical mining family for the time. While injuries from accidents, health conditions and illnesses were all very common amongst miners in the country, miners also had to contend with dangerous gases. Unfortunately, one of the worst explosions in mining history took place in Scotland and Lanarkshire. On the uh, 22nd of October 1877, an explosion of methane, commonly known as fire damp, ripped through the splint co-workings of numbers two and three of William Dixon's Blantyre Colliery. 207 men were killed, the youngest a boy of only 11. The accident left 92 widows and 250 children without fathers. In the following two years, there were a further two more explosions, killing six and then 28 people. And I mentioned Blantyre to highlight the dangers that Scottish miners faced. But also in the same year, 1877, there was a gas explosion at Preston Grange Colliery, which killed two men and a boy. So unsurprisingly, in light of several major explosions, a race began to create a safety lamp that would provide miners with light while reducing the risk of carrying a naked flame. 
The two main gases found underground were black damp, which was carbon monoxide and a lack of oxygen, and the second was fire damp or methane. Originally, cal uh, Candles were used underground, which were then followed by towel lamps. And towel lamps were essentially brass or tin containers filled with animal fat or towel. And the miners would hook these to their flat caps, as shown in the photograph. There weren't many safety measures at this time, and there certainly were no hard hats. Uh, but as you can imagine, as fire damp is much lighter than air and would tend to float around your head, having an open flame at your head was a great risk. So eventually this led to the invention of the safety lamps. And after much competition between a few inventors, Humphrey Davy's safety lamp came to be well adopted across Scotland. The lamp had a relatively simple design. There was a basic lamp with a gauze chimney that enclosed the flame. The holes in the gauze would let some light through, but the gauze would also capture most of the heat from the flame, meaning that the flame couldn't heat enough flammable gas to cause an explosion. Measures did start to be introduced and many became law, such as the Mines Act of 1911. And this included having a second shaft for ventilation and as an emergency exit. And that all pits employing over 100 men had to have at least five trained rescue miners. And in this photograph here, you can see Fleets and Ormiston Mines Rescue Team, obviously a little bit later than the time period we are discussing. And much later on, electric lamps eventually replaced these safety lamps in the late 1940s. So just going on another little tangent to New Craig Hall Colliery, or Klondike as it was known, this photograph was taken in 1957 and shows shot firers stemming shot holes. The man on the left is using a carbide lamp to illuminate the hole for his colleague. But I specifically wanted to discuss an incident that occurred here during the Second World War, which brought the pit to a standstill. So as we know, coal was vital for the war effort and miners were exempt from conscription. And later, one in 10 men were actually conscripted to the pits themselves. And they became known as the Bevan Boys. In August, 1943, Two New Creek Hall men refused to go underground as instructed. And this was seen as a breach to the National Service Order. And they were sentenced at Edinburgh Sheriff Court to a month's imprisonment. A strike in support of them by 200 night shift workers escalated to include all 1,500 men at the colliery. Sending them all to prison was impractical, to say the least. So it was eventually resolved by the other miners talking to the two imprisoned men into joining them underground. But looking back to East Lothian specifically, its coal mines were relatively modest in both number and scale compared with its neighbours in Mid Lothian and Fife, but they did extend under the Firth of Forth. As discussed, many centuries of mining activity in East Lothian had fueled some important local industries, including salt pans, glass and ceramics works. But only six collieries were taken on by the National Coal Board, the NCB, in 1947. Of these, Preston Lynx and Preston Grange were easily the largest, the former having an average workforce of almost 800 miners in ensuing years. Only one other colliery, Fleets, near Trenent, employed more than 500 men annually. The industry peaked in East Lothian in 1948, employing a total of just over 3,000 people. Prior to nationalisation in 1947, the mines of East Lothian, which produced a range of house, steam and gas coals, were operated by several different companies. However, one of the more significant companies was Summerlee Iron Company of Coatbridge, who acquired Preston Grange Colliery in 1895. So let's take a closer look at Preston Grange. With the coal outcroppings close to the sea, we know that coal has been used to fire the salt pans for centuries. 
Preston Grange Colliery itself developed later as a number of shallow self-draining mines and remained this way until a Newcastle mining engineer took out a lease and sunk two shafts. However, he gave the pit up around 1838 and the pit appears to have been worked intermittently by the Grant Sutty family after this time. It was reopened in 1874 by the Preston Grange Coal and Iron Company. The number two shaft was redeveloped to work the dual coal and number one shaft used to pump out the huge quantities of water that were in the pit. A beam pumping engine made in Cornwall was installed and actually remained in service until 1954. The colliery remained under the ownership of the Grant Sutties of Preston Grange House until 1895 when the Summerlee and Moss End Iron and Steel Company took it over. They started redeveloping, sank a ventilation shaft and increased output to 500 tonnes per day. Preston Grange also produced a good quality fire clay, which went to make fire bricks, tiles and pipes. And you can see the beehive shaped kilns in this photograph. When the NCB took over in 1947, they rebuilt the kilns, carried out other redevelopment work at the pit, including the new pit head baths, the 100th built in Scotland. And Preston Grange finally closed in 1962. Uh, photographed here is Summer Lee Street. The Summer Lee Iron Company moved many mining families from Lanarkshire to Preston Pans to work in their newly acquired pit. They built the street of brick upstairs downstairs housing and named it Summer Lee Street. So there's quite a contrast between this style of housing and the beautiful houses that we saw just earlier on this afternoon. But looking over to Preston Links Colliery, it was started and ran by Nimmo and Co, but Edinburgh Collieries took the pit over in 1912 and still operated it at the time of nationalisation. The coal board initially predicted a long life for Preston Links, but this didn't last, and they slowed production in 1962 and closed it in 1964. This gave rise to a widely held view amongst former miners that it was sacrificed to make way for the Kikensi power station, which was built on the site soon after closure. And many of the men were bused daily to Moncton Hall Colliery, which provided the coal for Kikensi. Fleet's Colliery was operated by Edinburgh Colliery's company prior to nationalisation and produced coal for house, steam and gas. And this also closed in 1959. During the late 1940s and early 1950s, the NCB commenced three new drift mine pro projects at Bellyford, Mill and Winton, all three lasting little more than a decade. Um, indeed, with the exception of Limey Lands and Tynemount, both of which closed in the early 1950s, the East Lothian coal industry was effectively eradicated in a five-year period between 1958 and 1963. Four small private mines operated in East Lothian in this period, and the last of these mines ceased to operate by 1987. However, substantial open cast projects, particularly at Blind Wells, which I think earlier today as well, ensured that the county continued to produce significant quantities of coal. So as mentioned, with the closure of the two largest pits at Preston Grange in 1962 and Preston Links in 63, East Lothian's significant deep mining came to an end. Preston Grange stands today as a fantastic museum as mentioned, Preston Links was demolished shortly after make way for Kikensi Power Station. But thank you very, all very much for listening to me, and I'm going to pass you on to the second half of our talk. Thank you, Nicola. <clears throat> I'm now over to Melanie, Melanie Johnson for the industrial side.
Cool. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, thanks, Nicola. Um, I want to follow on from the coal mining to look at some of the industries that were fueled by that coal. And I'm going to use Preston Grange as a case study um, representative of what was going on um, throughout the wider East Lothian. So, for those of you that don't know, I hope that you will. <laughs> Preston Grange is a, an open air colliery museum managed by East Lothian Council. It's located between Musselburgh and Preston Pans. Between 2004 and 2010, CFA uh, Archaeology Limited, who I work for, um, and East Lothian Council ran the Preston Grange Community Archaeology Project at the museum. Um, its aim was to explore this earlier industrial heritage. At the outset, this project was conceived as a community project to provide local people with an opportunity to get involved with an archaeological excavation and to provide new information on the Preston Grange site. And I have to say, I'm delighted that there are still some of my old volunteers here, including David. <laughs> uh, the museum site, is owned by East Lothian Council, has a long history of industrial manufacture. Today, the coast road, um, the reclaimed land on the foreshore and the 20th century structures surviving from the colliery and the brick and tile works, as seen in um, the pictures that Nicola was showing, including this rare Hoffman kiln built in 1937 and the Cornish beam engine, all obscure the earlier phases of activity at the site. These earlier industries, all the way up to the 20th century, were able to develop on this part of East Lothian's coastline because of the abundance of locally available natural resources. You had salt, ke ke uh, coal, clay, fire clay, sand, and of course the sea. This meant raw materials could be easily procured, the coal to power the factories was readily available, and the products could be shipped out to sea off to their markets. It makes Preston Grange a special place and a microcosm of the industries being developed all over the county. Early documentary records reveal that the area was being used for coal exploitation, as we've heard, and as we've also heard, for uh, salt panning, probably as far back as the 12th and 13th centuries under the ownership of New Battle Abbey, when the land was part of the monastic grange. While we've not yet found any direct evidence for salt panning at Preston Grange, there is documentary records of salt pans to the media east of Morrison's Haven Harbour from at least the, the 16th century. And this map shows um, an old salt gurnal um, in that pink circle, which was still recorded on the maps of the 18th century pottery. The accumulated industrial waste from the salt operations at Morrison's Haven was also used to help reclaim land from the sea before the 19th century. Salt panning was, however, very common along the coast here, for example, at Kakenzie Harbour, where a complex of 12 salt pan houses were operated in the 17th and 18th centuries, the largest in Scotland. I'm not going to talk too much more about salt panning, but to learn more about salt panning, I really do encourage you to visit the 1722 Wagon Way project. Um, again, they've been mentioned a few times today. They have an excellent website in the Heritage Centre in Kakenzie, just by the harbour. They've carried out excavations at the salt pans at Kakenzie Harbour, um, and they have a replica of an 18th century salt pan, which will be operating, I believe, within the grounds of Kakenzie House over the coming months. So I really do encourage you to go and, and see that in action. So at Preston Grange, we've got the harbour, um, Morrison's Haven. It's opposite the museum and it's now infilled. It's just on that grass area directly opposite the museum. Uh, but it is one of, or was one of the important factors in Preston Grange's success. And it remained a very busy port until the 1930s. It was eventually filled in in the 1960s. I don't know if you can see. Uh... No. Um, there's the, the image there of Morrison's Haven Harbour up to the, the top left of that map with Preston Grange, um, the, the big house below. Um, so it's known from the historical and cartographic sources that the harbour at Morrison's Haven was established in about 1526 by the Aitchison family and was formerly known as Aitchison's Haven. 
There are documentary records of the monks of New Battle Abbey shipping coal from Aitchison's Haven, but this was probably just using boats um, pulled up onto the shore rather than being uh, pulled into the harbour. There was at least one tidal mill and mill pond located here, originally uh, for grinding corn and later for flint. This map, which you probably can't see terribly well, is a plan of 1850. Um, the blue is the the, the tidal um, the the tidal pond for the mill with the harbour um, next to it, and inside that pink circle, there's a wee building marked mill. The yellow there is the original um, post road, and you've got the the pottery inside where Preston Grange Museum is today. So the um, the tidal mill and the mill pond um, in for for grinding corn, but later was used for flint, um, and the flint powder produced was used in the potteries for making cream-coloured glazes. So research has shown that Morrison's Haven was no mere small-scale local harbour, but from the outset was intended to be a significant commercial venture that could challenge the local dominance of Leith, and alongside the ready supply of coal made a substantial contribution to the industrial development of the site. Morrison's Haven was used to import timber, rock salt, gravel, stone and clay, and to export coal. And we heard earlier from Brian about the, the movement of these kinds of products around, around Europe. Uh, before the 1800s, glass and pottery were being exported, but later this changed to brick and tile and pipes as the, um, the dominant industry at Preston Grange changed towards the brick and tile works. As part of the Preston Grange um, Community Archaeology Project, the shipping records of the early 20th century were transcribed and they showed just how many shipments of coal, brick and tile were coming in and out of, of this wee harbour at Morrison's Haven. In the 17th and 18th centuries, there should be something on that slide. <laughs> Hmm. Okay. Weird. Uh, in the 17th and 18th centuries, Preston Grange was home to an industrial glassmaking facility, the first of its kind in Scotland. In the early part of the 17th century, fine glassware was being produced by Venetian glass workers, and by the later part of the same century, um, plate glass and bottles were being produced. By the 1830s, a pottery was founded on the site of the now defunct glassworks, owned first by Anthony Hillcote and then by George Gordon. And together with other important East Coast potteries of the period, it was producing various ceramic wares that were being exported across Europe and further afield. And I'll come back to these two industries shortly. In the 1890s, the colliery expanded and brick and drainage tile manufacture took place on the site. As Nicholas said, coal production ceased in 1962 and brick production came to an end around 1975. So onto the excavations undertaken as part of the Preston Grange Community Archaeology Project. So this project concentrated on finding the remains of these pre-19th century industries. To that end, a variety of activities were undertaken. Uh, we did test pitting, excavation, geophysics, historic building recording, walkover survey, historical research, oral, oral reminiscence projects. We had a wee exhibition. Um, so uh, overall, the, lo the excavations located a, a pocket of preservation amongst these later industrial developments, within which was found evidence of the Morrison's Haven glassworks and dumps of material within the glassworks flue, which comprised assemblages of late 18th century locally made pottery, which is as yet are unparalleled anywhere in Scotland. So I'm going to speak about some of the results and the wider industry of which they were part. Glassmaking began in Scotland when Sir George Hay of Netherliff, later the Earl of Canool, obtained a patent of monopoly to make iron and glass in 1610. He subsequently licensed others, licensed others to make glass under his patent. Wood-fired glass furnaces were banned in England and Wales in 1615, and as a result, entrepreneurs were funded from England to set up glass furnaces on or near the coal fields of Scotland. In an attempt to undermine this English monopoly held by Sir Robert Mansell, the Scots persuaded skilled European glassmakers to move to Morrison's Haven and other sites. The early Morrison's Haven glass furnace is unique in that we know the name of the Italian, 
Leonardo Michelini, who built it in 1622, and the names of 11 Venetian glassmakers who worked there in 1635, sending large quantities of fine glass to London. The skilled Venetians made fine façon de Venise crystal drinking glasses, similar to these ones, and other cheaper glasses like tumblers, uh, which were formed by blowing into patterned moulds. While there's no trace of the 17th century furnace, and very little survives of the, the fragile soda glass that was being produced, we do have evidence of the, the glass making from that period. And this early phase lasted from 1622 to 1698. The later period of glass making from 1698 to 1727 was uh, under William Morrison of Preston Grange. It's well documented and illustrates the value to a coal mine owner of setting up a business on his own land to buy the coal that he mined. Bulk supplies of coal were needed. and The glassworks was one of many customers supplied by the Preston Grange coal pits. An entry in the Preston Grange Factors account book from 1716 to 22 records a payment for 102 carts of coal sent to the glassworks. As well as local coal, the glass furnaces had to be near water transport so other raw materials could be brought in and the finished goods shipped out. So Morrison's Haven Harbour was also important. Morrison contracted a family of skilled glassmakers from Newcastle who, whose ancestors fled from, from Lorraine in northern France. However, his chequered career as an MP in both the Scottish and English parliaments and his increasing money problems did little to help the success of the glassworks at Morrison's Haven, which was eventually taken over by a very dubious concern who invested heavily and then abandoned it. The main products were bottles for wine or ale, the most common size, the Chopin being the equivalent of about one and a half imperial pints. But why bottles? The port of Leith was a major centre for the importation of barrels of wine. This wine was often bottled for resale or in some cases individuals bought barrels of wine and then had their own bottles made and they often had um, the names stamped onto the bottles like those in the, the bottom left. Um, an entry in the Preston Grange Factors account book for 1716 records a Leith vintner paying a £300 bill for bottles and a year later a payment of £366 was made for bottles. Um, there's also evidence that window glass and plate glass used for mirrors and um, windows for the wealthy, stagecoaches, that kind of thing were being made there, as were medicine bottles being used by pharmacists. So, in the initial phases of the project, we undertook test pitting in an area of sort of scrubby woodland. As this was an area which was available to us to investigate and had been uh, formerly within the footprint of the 18th century pottery factory. So, actually, we were hoping to find remains of the pottery. Um, I think you can just see. So, there's the main road. There's Morrison's Haven on the other side with the sea beyond it. There's the wee row of cottages that you see when you're driving along the road and in behind there was the er area of the excavation where we were hoping to find the pottery. However, we did not find the pottery. What we uncovered instead was the upstanding remains of an underground vaulted stone structure, which is the remains of an air flue for the 18th century glass kiln and other potentially related structures. This is the first physical evidence for the glassworks at Preston Grange. The flue was well preserved, in part having been reused as an air raid shelter, with a vaulted roof still surviving over half its length. Now, at the time that we entered it, we literally thought it was an air raid shelter. So on the outside, you've got this wee brick um, doorway. Uh, we generally thought it was just an air raid shelter, so we opened the door, we got in, we recorded it. We didn't know it was a flu, we just assumed it was a very well-built shelter. As you can see, it's, you know, it's been reinforced with these bars and you can see at the back the, the brickwork from the um, stairway coming into it. Now, once we started the excavation, we realised um, that in our trench, we had two parallel walls continuing on exactly the same alignment. And you can see these two parallel walls and at the back of the slide there is that entrance down into the air raid shelter. So what we think is that the air raid shelter reused the 18th century 
glassworks air flue and simply reinforced it, broke into it, um, stuck some stairs in, reinforced the ceiling and that was that. Um, so phenomenally it has survived because it was reused as a, as a World War II air raid shelter. So the flue itself, so this, the area, the part that we excavated in the trench uh, clearly didn't have its roof anymore. Um, but it was a, a narrow stone built passage. The floor was paved with stone flagstones and some areas of brickwork, um, some of which was reused from elsewhere. And the reuse of materials suggests that repair to the floor must have been pretty constant, caused by the raking out of the coal ash from the flue on a regular basis to prevent the flue from becoming choked up. So the discovery of this flue is uh, considered to be of national importance and provides the earliest surviving remains of, of glass manufacture in Scotland, demonstrating that Preston Grange was a highly significant industrial centre. The much larger above ground structure which contained the flue had been demolished by the later pottery. So uh, we'll come back to the other buildings, but here's the, the excavation plan, the green parallel walls there is the is the flue on the left hand side it's the bit that's the air raid shelter and on the right hand side it's the bit that we found in the excavation trench the orange is the later insertion of the brick and the steps and around it you've got the the blue which is much later 20th century brick buildings but the purple is um potentially buildings of the same age as the flue itself the yellow if you can see that is just some modern disturbance so how did the flue function as part of the glassworks? Oh. Right, there we go. Uh, the walls of the flue thicken at one point. So inside that pink circle, just where it butts up against the, the beginning of the air raid shelter steps, you can see there's a, a, a little bit of a narrowing of the passage. This narrow section marks the position of what we call the siege bench, um, the, the crucibles or pots, as they were called, containing the molten glass, would have sat on the siege benches on either side of the hearth. The hearth would have used coal and would have been supported on a grid of raw iron bars with an ash pit underneath to catch the hot ash falling through the iron bars. At Preston Grange, in this flue, the area below this, the siege is lined with red brick, which would have formed that ash pit floor. And the sand below the bricks was affected by the extreme temperature of the hot ash falling onto the, onto the, down into the ash pit. The use of raw iron bars forming a grid below the siege bench was an 18th century development typical of the one found at Preston Grange. And above that siege bench, the roof of the furnace, it would have been a, some sort of domed roof, um, would have deflected the heat back down onto those pots containing the, the molten glass. Now, the furnace would have perhaps contained four pots, um, a cone-shaped structure over it would have housed the furnace and provided a workshop for the glass blowers and would have covered over the, the siege. Did the Press and Grange glassworks have a cone like the Leith glassworks? That, that image at the shop is at, at the top is the, the Leith glassworks in the 1820s and that shows the cone. Um, the honest answer is actually we don't know. We don't know if, if Press and Grange had a cone. None of the above ground structures of the glassworks survive um, and not all glassworks had them. The first recorded cone in Scotland was at Leith, um, which was built in 1747, and the earliest cones in England date to about 1690. So it seems unlikely that there was a cone when the Preston Grange glassworks was first built. However, it remains possible that one was added later, but there's no, there's no written record of this. Um, if there was a cone, um, it would have been where that pink circle is sitting over the top of the siege bench. So there would have been a lot of ancillary buildings around the furnace of the, at the glassworks. So there would have been subsidiary furnaces for annealing, making frit, which is a partially fired mix of sand and the fluxes of which the glass is made. There would have been a pot loft for drying, a clay store, warehouses, um, and some of those could have been uh, within the cone or attached externally to it. 
The archaeological evidence for the ancillary bin buildings is limited, although the wall footings of some stone buildings were uncovered on both sides of the glass flue. Um, these structures were not too dissimilar to the flue in, in terms of um, construction. Um, it had been hoped that more robust dating evidence was uh, going to be found within these buildings to date them more precisely. But it was again, it was pretty limited. So a lot of it is supposition that, they're, that they are related. However, there was this one shirt found in, in the top right of this slide. It's uh, possibly a 16th century um, shirt from an imported Italian Miolica wet drug jar. Uh, and that slide under the picture underneath shows what that would have looked like when it was complete. Um, so that possibly provides a, an earliest possible date of the buildings of the 16th century. So they could well be um, have formed part of the, the glassworks. By the 18th century, uh, a pottery was founded on the site. Um, the glassworks had closed and the pottery was built over the top. And that, together with other East Coast potteries of the period, was producing various pottery wares that were being exported across Europe and further afield. A number of potters are known to have worked along the coast here, but we'll focus on the factory within the Preston Grange Museum site. Anthony Hillcote was a potter from Newcastle, and he's recorded as having been potting at West Pans around 1750. He then appears in a document from 1758 where he's called the master of the potter work at Morrison's Haven. In 1761, he rented land at Morrison's Haven along with his brother-in-law, where they built or extended a pottery. Production at Hillcote's pottery continued here with Anthony's son, son Thomas as well until around 1772. The pottery was advertised to let in 1769, along with a mill for grinding flint and a range of houses very proper for the various branches of the pottery business. So it was very much a going concern at that point. The father and son Hillcoats then relocated to Portobello, which was the site of a large clay bed, which was in the process of being developed and they carried on potting there instead. In 1767, there's a record of a potter called John Raining at Morrison's Haven. He did a runner in 1768, owing rent and other money to the Earl of Hindford. The goods he left behind were sold, including a parcel of hard stoneware, which may have been what we now call white salt glazed stoneware, which was known to have been made at the time by other potters in the area. In 1772, George Gordon, and uh, that image on the right there is a um, uh, Taken, it's not a great image because it's taken from the letterhead from um, uh, some documentation from George Gordon, which shows the, the bottle kilns on the left hand side of it. And the other map shows the, um, the layout of Gordon's pottery. So George Gordon took a 19 year lease at Morrison's Haven, which was described as land which was formerly enclosed as a glass house, along with houses and buildings erected some time ago also the sea mill and a range of houses at that time possessed by Anthony Hillcote in which he carried on a pottery work. So refined earthenwares from the late last quarter of the 18th century, first quarter of the 19th century can be attributed to him. Gordon's pottery finally closed due to dispute with the Earl of Hindford's estate over the use of clay for the making of bricks and um, some land on the shore. So you can see on this slide, there's a little green strip um, which is described as ground in dispute. So they were having an argument over this parcel of land that was adjacent to the shore. Um, and I think, yeah, Gordon just kind of went, I'm off. <laughs> uh, so Gordon's pottery is pretty well documented and shown on historical maps, but no structural remains, certainly not in our excavation area anyway. It doesn't mean that they're not under there. There could be somewhere under there. It was a pretty extensive um, factory, but we didn't find any um, evidence, physical evidence of the pottery within that area, probably due to the, again, the 19th and 20th century industrial use of the site, the, the re-landscaping clearance and, and whatnot, particularly in the 1970s, which um, has erased all above ground traces. However, we did find uh, a pretty significant deposit of locally made late 18th century pottery dumped into, inside that abandoned glassworks flue. 
This deposit has a tightly dated age range of 1764 to 1782 and is a large collection of hitherto unseen forms, which has helped to fill the gaps with, with new pottery types. Um, and you can see on the left there, that's, it, was, it was literally just coming out in great handfuls of, of pottery. Um, so some of this pottery produced, uh, known as joggled slipwares, you basically uh, pour this thin slip into the bowl and shuggle it around. Um, and that was being made at both West Pans and Morrison's Haven by Hillcote, along with these scraffito wares. Um, and one of these dishes, so on the left hand side there, there's a, a scraffito dish. I don't know how easy it is to make out, but it's, a, it's an image of a sailing ship on there. Uh, another unique item that we had was the pear-shaped flask. That's the one on the right-hand side nearest to me. Um, and some unglazed syrup-type jars. Um, these are a bit unusual. Um, so the, the thought from the pottery specialist, George Haggerty, is that they were produced for um, the top secret press and pans vitriol works. That was built in 1749 by the scientist John Roebuck and Samuel Garbett. So they probably had some form of um, it, use in, in some kind of chemical process. Um, the George Gordon products also included transfer printed designs, some of which not seen anywhere else, um, various roulette and hand painted wares. And these have really helped to fill in the gaps of what was known of what George Gordon was producing. So people that study, you know, 19th century pottery um, have found that while it's just a dump of material, um, they found it to be really helpful in filling in the gaps of, of finding out what George Gordon was producing in his factories. Um, so it really has, yes, noteworthy, it really has increased our understanding of the East Lothian potting industry at that time. So, in summary, um, the East Lothian coal fields and the entrepreneurship of people over the last 800 years meant that this resource was capitalised on and became the backbone of many local industries, including glass manufacture, pottery, brick and tile, salt production and many others. Both the excavated glassworks and the pottery assemblages recovered from it are considered to be of national importance and demonstrate that the Preston Grange site was a well-established and highly significant industrial centre employing many skilled local people and supporting a wide network of imports and exports, making it truly the powerhouse of East Lothian. Um, the site has been published. Uh, those are on screen. Um, I also do encourage you to visit the museum if you get the chance. Uh, final thanks. Many, many volunteers um, got involved with the project over the years, getting involved in a, in a really wide variety of tasks and none of that could have been achieved without them. So many thanks to those volunteers and uh, everybody else who was involved in the project in one way or another.